Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, program number four for this afternoon, and for those of you joining us on television, uh, just watch our formula on the board. We are presently winding up book number 48, so if you care to get a tape or anything of that kind, keep that number on your mind. We are back in Hebrews chapter 4, and uh, while you in the studio audience look that up, we're going to uh, let our television audience know that we're not underwritten by anyone. We are just so appreciative of your prayers and of your offerings that make it possible for us to reach as many people as we are. Again, uh, we uh, never try to attack anyone or ridicule or criticize. We're just going to simply open up the scriptures and uh, let the word speak for itself. All right, let's go back where we left off. We were in chapter 4, verse 14, and I don't feel like I really finished it as much as I should. Now I'm uh, verse 15, I'm sorry. And uh, so we'll look at verse 15 for a few moments and uh, then hopefully finish the chapter in this half hour. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, and let's stop in at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed <clears throat> into the heavens. And remember, going back to chapter 3, that when he passed into the heavens, having purged our sins, he what? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And remember, I made the point that when he sat down, what did it indicate? That it was finished, right. Oh, that the work was finished. There was an, another iota that could be added to it. And consequently, he could rest and be aware that it was totally finished. So here again, this high priest has passed into the heavens and uh, on the other hand, he can be touched with a feeling of our infirmities because he was in all points tempted or tested like as we are, yet without or apart from sin. In other words, even the thought of yielding to the temptation never entered his mind. Now, the best way to find the three categories of temptations that cover every possible scenario of the human experience, we can find in the little first John, the little letter of first John, chapter two. Now we did this way back when poor old Eve was caught in temptations in Genesis chapter three. <clears throat> we probably used it when we covered the temptations in our study of Matthew, but it never hurts to repeat. So here we have in 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 15, where he writes, Love not the world. In other words, this world system. Neither the things that are in the world or materialism. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now here's the world, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Now, I already mentioned Eve. Let's jump all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and see how that she was pummeled with all three of them at one time. Most of us are dealt one at a time. We may suddenly find ourselves confronted with something that is desirable to an appetite of the flesh. Another thing may just appeal to our pride. Something else may appeal to our eye. But see, Eve was confronted with all three at one time. Chapter 3 Verse 6, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman, poor Eve, when she saw that the tree was good for food and it was 
pleasant to the what? To the eye. So what do we got? Here was a fruit that was an object of the lust of her eyes. It was a beautiful fruit. Now, I want an apple, but, but whatever it was, it must have been beautiful. It was alluring. It must have just looked delicious. And of course, with Satan's prodding, it just looked all the better. And then the next part was that this same beautiful fruit was something that would make her wise. Now, what does that appeal to? The pride. See? Pride. That it would make her wise. And remember, Satan's temptation was that she could be as God. See? All right. Then, her third step was she took the fruit thereof and did eat. Now, listen. Have any of you ever been so full of a good large dinner that you couldn't eat another bite? Of course you have. Just the thought of another bite just almost becomes repulsive. So really, in order to enjoy something, you have to be a little bit what? Hungry. <laughs> My wife knows that better than anybody, see? Oh, when, when you're hungry, just about anything can taste delicious. So what I have to, even though the scripture itself does not definitively say it, Eve must have had enough of an appetite to really want to satisfy the desire to eat. And then what did she do? She plucked the fruit, she looked at it again, and she suddenly desired the flesh of that fruit to satisfy her hunger, but also her old mind was just a spinning like everything. What's it going to do to her? It's going to make her wise. And so here she is pummeled, with all three categories of temptation at one time. I guess it's no wonder she succumbed, is it? But you see, the Lord went through those same three categories up here in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. But remember, apart from sin, he never had any inkling to give in like Eve did. But nevertheless, in Matthew chapter 4, at the temptations, this was the whole purpose. This was the purpose. So that when he became our great high priest, he knew exactly what we go through. He too was tempted with making those stones bread when he was hungry. He too was tempted to fulfill a desire of the eyes. He too was given the temptation. I guess that one is the easiest to understand is uh, chapter 4. And like I said, don't ever get the idea that he even thought about succumbing. But this is simply given to us to understand that he knows what we're going through. Because you see, you can't really understand unless you've been there. Just the other day, I got a letter from a gentleman who had just lost his wife of 46 years or something like that. And I just wrote a short note to him and I said something like this. I can't say I know how it feels because I haven't been there. I can't really say that I can sympathize with you because I haven't walked in your shoes. I haven't lost my wife. And isn't that true of anything? You can't really understand the feelings that people are going through unless you've been there. And unless you have lost a spouse, you don't know what it's like. Unless you have been faced with a certain dilemma that's unique to your own situation, you don't know what it's like. But see, the Lord did. The Lord faced these three categories so that he would know exactly what the human race is going through. He knew what it was like that when he was hungry to have Satan mention bread. He knew what it was like when Satan said, fall down and worship me and all the kingdoms of this world, I'll give them to you. Well, now it never affected him because they were already his. But what we have to learn from it is Satan was tempting him with something that would make a human being proud. That's why men attain to be emperors. That's why they attain world power, is to satisfy 
their pride. And so the Lord could honestly say without any doubt whatsoever, I've been there. I know what you're going through. I know exactly what it's like. And that's why we can go to him with full assurance that since he has tasted temptations, he has been confronted. Let's even go a little further. As he was going through the suffering leading up to the cross, and he cried out at one time, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Do you realize what he was saying? Do you realize what he was really saying? If there was any way that God could perform salvation without his having to go through that which was coming, do it the other way. What was that? Well, it was really a temptation that he could have somehow avoided the sufferings of the cross. But he didn't, see? He never did. And so always take these things into consideration when you read a verse like this, that he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity because he's been there. He's walked in our shoes. All right, now then let's go on down to verse 16. <clears throat> And again, one of Paul's favorite words, therefore. I love the way Paul uses therefore over and over and over through his letters. I guess the first one that comes to mind, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. That's right. See, you're already wording it. Therefore, because of all that Paul had written in those first six, seven chapters of Romans, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. To those who have come in by faith plus nothing. Oh, the world thinks it's faith plus. Do this and do that. Fulfill this little prescribed ritual. Fulfill this little operation and then you can have eternal life. No, no. It's faith plus what? Nothing. I guess if I'm known for anything, it's that. It's faith plus nothing. Now be sure it's faith in the right place. It's faith in that finished work. All right, now then, verse 16 again. Therefore, because of the high priest that we have, because he has passed into the heavens, he's not someplace on earth. We don't have to go to some headquarters, not even a denominational headquarters. We don't have to go someplace in order to get into the right mood and mode for prayer. We can come boldly. Now, I just went back and had to look up some of the Greek and, and some of the commentaries. Do you know what that word boldly means? Just exactly like you get it on the first impression. We go into the throne room without any apology. I don't have to say, well, now, Lord, here I am. You know, I, I really don't have any right to ask you this. Uh-uh. We are instructed. We are commanded to go boldly into his breath. Now, why? Why? Because, again, it just affirms what a great salvation we have. Now, if I didn't have this great a salvation... I couldn't go boldly into God's presence. But I can with anything. Hey, when we work cattle, I have no compunction about saying, now, Lord, let those critters behave themselves today. Because there's a big difference. Those of you who know livestock, there's a big difference from one day to the next. Some days they can be as cantankerous as they can be. Other days they'll just walk into that chute like docile little teddy bears, see? And I have no compunction going right into the throne room and I say, now, Lord, Make it a little easier on us today. Now, that's mundane, I know. But nevertheless, that's just an example that you and I can go into the throne room of heaven boldly, without any excuse, without any doubt, knowing that he knows Les Faldi, he knows Charles Daniels, he knows Jerry Poole, he knows every one of you by name. Every one of you. 
and you don't have to introduce yourself when you get there. <laughs> he knows who you are. He knows what you're going to ask before we do, see? Oh, oh, what a precious verse. What a precious verse. Now just feed on it. Okay, so let us therefore remember all that has been coming out of these first four chapters. Don't be like those Jews at Kadesh Barnea and in unbelief say, no, God, you can't do it. But come with faith believing who He is. He's God the Son. He's the Creator. He's the Sustainer. He's the one who finished the work of salvation. Nobody can add anything to it. It's done. And oh, listen, all of Christendom, all of Christendom is trying to add something to it. They're patching it on something here and they're sticking on something there. And listen, you come into that pure, unadulterated gospel of the grace of God. You know, I had a pastor write the other day. He said, Les, he said, why is it? The more I preach the grace of God, the less people want to hear it. And it's so true. People don't want to hear it. They'd far rather go and hear a, a big, booming instrumental group entertain them than to hear what you're hearing today. You know it's true. Because that's where the masses are. And all they want is to be entertained. They want some feel-good ears itching stuff that they can go home and uh, then go through the week and coast until they get another little high. But listen, we are resting on that finished work of the cross. The Christ who has passed into the heavens, the one who has faced every temptation that we face, and consequently then, therefore, we can come boldly without any qualifications on our part to the throne of grace. What's grace? Unmerited favor. Do I have any reason to expect something like this? No. Nor do you. There's no reason God should say, well, come on in boldly. Share your needs. Share your joys. Share your sorrows. I've got an open ear. No, there's no reason for him to do that. Except what? Grace. Grace. Oh, how God loves to be gracious. How He loves to just pour out all of His goodness. All right, so we come into the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Mercy. What do we deserve? Judgment. But what do we get? Mercy. Oh, let's go back to Exodus. That's the first place that this is really explained in, uh, in perfect order. I hope I can find it. Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Clear back into the law of Israel. Even under law. Even under law. What made it possible for a Jew to get right standing with God. His grace. His grace. My goodness, you all know as well as I do, time after time, what did God have every right and reason to do with Israel? Whoosh! Wipe them off the face of the map. They didn't deserve it. But it isn't just Israel. We're no different. My, as much as we love our beloved America, do we deserve another day of our liberty? No, we don't deserve it. No more than any other group of people. But oh, we've been enjoying it now for several hundred years because of God's mercy and grace. See? All right, Exodus 33, verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And now here it comes. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. What is that telling you? God in His sovereignty 
can show mercy to whomever he wills. He doesn't have to, but he does. Because in his sovereignty, that's just his bent. He is the God of all grace. He is the God of mercy. And so, in order for us, now come back to Hebrews, in order for us to come into this throne room of grace, vile sinners couldn't get there. No one polluted with the sin of this world could possibly come into the holy presence of God. So what did he have to do? He had to make a provision. We couldn't do it. And here we come right back full circle to that work of the cross. And so when Christ died and shed his blood and paid the price of our redemption and proclaimed it as what? Finished. Now what we can do? We can come right into the throne room without having joined anything, without having done anything, without having given anything. You know, I just had a thought at break time. Somebody was telling me how his pastor was so hung up on tithing. And I said, next time you see him, you ask him. Well, if tithing is so all important to you people, why is it that 90% of church members don't? Have you ever thought of that? Now, I'm pulling that number out of the air, I'll, I'll admit. But I, I, I get that number from years and years ago. A group of us were, were just having coffee after an evening church service, and we got talking about church finances and so forth. And it just so happened that our church treasurer was in our midst, and we were not the kind of people that ever found out who was given what. But as we were talking about our church finance and so forth, our treasurer made this statement. Well, he said, fellas, do you realize that 90, well, I don't remember the exact number, but it was 90 some percent of our giving comes from 5% of our people? Now, you take that into your own church, and I'll bet it's not very far off where 5% of your congregation is probably giving over 90% of the budget. Well, if tithing is so almighty important so far as eternal destiny is concerned, what are they doing with these 90% that aren't tithing? That would scare me to death if I were a preacher and I was depending on that. You know what I'd have to say? I'm doing something wrong. I am doing something totally wrong the vast percentage of my people are going to miss it. But see, it isn't on that. We are not boldly coming into the throne room of grace because I gave 20% of my income. I don't come boldly into the throne room because I'm such a good guy. Every one of us come in there on the same premise. And what is it? The mercy and the grace of God. That's all. And oh, God is so good. My goodness, I have to tell him every morning, Lord, I don't deserve all these blessings. Neither do you. We're all alike. We're all human. Not a one of us can go into that room room and say, Lord, I'm here because I deserve it. No, I'm here because of what you have done. See? And so we come boldly that we may obtain mercy and find that unmerited favor, especially when? When we need it. When's that? All the time. That's all the time. They're in the moment that we don't need the grace and the mercy of God, especially in the world in which we're living today. We're bombarded from every direction with everything imaginable. And it's only the grace of God. All right, that reminds me of a verse that we share so often when people call with a particular prayer request. Many of you know where I'm going. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. What, what a basis for prayer. Philippians Chapter 4, 
starting at verse 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful, or in our present day language we'd say, worry about nothing. Be careful or worry about nothing. But in everything. Now what does word everything mean? Everything. God doesn't limit. Now there are some people who say that God doesn't listen to anything unless it's spiritual. I don't buy that. God listens to your every legitimate need. Now we're not going to be frivolous. We're not going to be silly when we come into God's presence, but there isn't anything that is of any note that God isn't willing to hear about, wants to hear about it, see? All right, so worry about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, what the secret is, the next two words, with what? Thanksgiving. In other words, you thank the Lord before you even tell Him what you're asking for. And you thank Him for what He's going to do, see? And so with thanksgiving, you let your requests be made known unto God. Does God not know what you need? Of course He does. But what does the heart of God long for between Himself and the believer? Communication. God wants us to talk to Him. God wants us to commune with Him. And that's what prayer is all about. It's a two-way street. He speaks to us through His Word. We speak to Him through prayer, see? And so, He makes so well known that we are to come with thanksgiving. We're to bring our requests. And then Iris and I usually tell people, now that doesn't say that He's going to give a direct answer to everything we ask for. He may say yes. You may have an immediate answer. He may say no. He may not answer the way we think He should. Or he may tell us to wait a while. But the next verse is your immediate answer. The next verse is what we get every time we come to the throne room boldly. And what is it? The peace that passeth all understanding. That peace of God. Not the peace with God. You got that when you were saved. But now as a believer, you come into the throne room boldly and you share all your needs and your desires of your heart. And what a God says, yes, no, maybe later, whatever, you have what? That peace with God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.